And uh, part of the scripture that I want to focus on right there is in Isaiah 55, 11, And it says, So shall my word be that goeth out forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. And um, the title of my message today is just the power of God's word. The power of God's word. And the reason that I'm preaching this really is just that it was more of a conversation that I had a couple of weeks ago with uh, one of the brothers here in church. We were out soul winning. And let me make a clarifying statement. We weren't discouraged, but it can be a little bit disappointing when you're knocking on doors for a while and you just get a bunch of no's or people don't answer and you just don't lead anybody to crack. But, you know, I was just given uh, the brother a word of encouragement. And I, and I took him there to 50, Isaiah 55, 11, and I said, you know, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter whether we get the result that we think we should get. You know, God's word won't return void to him. So, you know, one of the most encouraging works that we can do is to be soul winners or to work in the Lord. And you'll have to excuse me. I got a little bit of the hiccups, and I try to work it out before the, the sermon and the message started. But apparently that wasn't God's will, so we're going to have to just uh, work right through it but the more you think about it and then so we just got to talking a little bit and then we got to talking about just how powerful you know that statement really is about God's word goes out and it doesn't return unto him void you know the miracle and the supernatural of events and occurrences that occur when we go out there and we don't know how many people have accepted Jesus Christ after the fact you know, we, 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 we glory with those that receive Jesus Christ or that learn of, of the Lord through us, but we don't know about how many people that uh, have accepted Jesus Christ because they heard it through a sermon or we went door knocking and they gave us time to give them the message. And, you know, sometimes we'll take them through the entire gospel presentation, five, ten, maybe fifty minutes, and then all of a sudden... You say, hey, you know, I, I like to lead you in a word of prayer. It's not the prayer that saves, but, you know, believing on the word that we're about to pray. And then they just, for some odd reason, the timing's just not there. And who knows how many of those individuals and how, how many of their friends and family have accepted Jesus Christ just because we went out and we preached the word of God. But the way that I'm going to tie it together is, you know, the world is always thinking that they're ahead of the game. And... You know, I liken this to what people have studied as known as the butterfly effect or the chaos theory. And I'm going to read to you what that is. You know, I'm not, I'm not a big nerd or anything by the imagination, but I do like to study uh, science and I do like to read and I like to learn new things and then just tie it and see how it works or ties in with the Word of God. And, you know, one of the things here is, and this came off of Wikipedia, of course. Wiki Wikipedia, if you know anything about them, it's usually updated. Now, the people that update it, it's a public forum where people can update the information. For the most part, though, when it comes to the scientific stuff, it'll be pretty accurate, and you can cross-reference and verify that. But it is a, a very quick and easy way to get information without having to sit there and study all the books and, and go out there and maybe to the library or buy the information or look it up. But if you look, you know, um, in chaos theory, this is from Wikipedia, the butterfly effect is the sensitive dependence on initial conditions in which a small change in one state of a de uh, deterministic nonlinear system can result in large differences in a larger state. The term was coined by Edward Lorenz, is derived from a metaphorical example of the details of a tornado, the exact time of formation, the exact path taken, being influenced by minor pertur perturbations, such as the flapping of the wings of a distant butterfly several weeks earlier. So Lawrence discovered the effect when he observed that runs of his weather model with the initial condition data was rounded in a seemingly inconsequential inco manner would fail to reproduce the results of runs with the unrounded initial condition data. So a very small change in the initial conditions had created a significantly different outcome. Though Lawrence gave a name to the phenomenon, the idea that small causes may have large effects in general and in weather specifically was earlier recognized by French mathematician and engineer Henri Poincar and American mathematician and philosopher Norbert Wiener 
Edward Lawrence's work placed the concept of instability of the Earth's atmosphere <laughs> on a quantitative base and linked the concept of instability to the property of large classes of dynamic systems which are undergoing nonlinear dynamics and deterministic chaos. And I know you didn't come to a science class, and a lot of that sounds really smart or whatever, but basically, what, and, and these guys, not me, by the way, Edward Lawrence figured out that it's small changes in the environment can cause big changes to the entire weather system. And it really it derived from the chaos theory, which is a branch, and I'm not going to read that whole thing, but it's a branch of mathematics focusing on behavior of dynamical systems that are highly sensitive to initial conditions. Chaos is an inter interdisciplinary theory stating that within the apparent randomness of chaotic, complex systems, there are underlying patterns. You know, it's one of the things that, that I love to explain to people because, you know, one of the things that you run into when you're preaching the gospel or when you're talking about God's word is, you know, people try, try to throw in, for, first of all, one of the main arguments is that man wrote the Bible. Well, we know God wrote the Bible. You know, there is no such thing as a random act. There is no such thing as true chaos because there's always an underlying pattern. What's interesting is that it takes these scientists years of calculations, and I mean, I could have printed up the actual mathematical formulas. Of course, I was never very good. I mean, I barely passed trigonometry, so some of this stuff is calculus, and I would have just confused you and confused me. You know, I was never very good at advanced mathematics, but basically there's advanced mathematical formulas to prove that in a in what seems random or coincidental or chaotic, there's an actual underlying pattern. Well, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, 11, it says, So shall my words be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whether, whereto I sent it. And if you go back a few verses in Isaiah 50, uh, 55, verse 8, he says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my, your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then I love this verse. It says, For as the rain cometh down in the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it break forth and bud, it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So what seems for us like just a... Uh, pattern of rain, you know, just uh, storms and clouds and rain falling and it looks like it's just falling anywhere. The reality is that God's already set up the weather system or the world to function in such a way that there's an underlying pattern to give certain things to us to provide certain uh, outcomes. So how much more is His Word going to provide an outcome for us? And it really is an interesting thing because if we don't study or we don't look at God's word in that kind of powerful context, then it's real easy to fall into the trap of the world of some of the things that they try to preach. You know, I mean, you hear stuff out there now lately of, you know, I mean, things like the false doctrine of oneness has taken root or, you know, I heard this a few years back, but apparently it keeps gaining ground that people believe that the earth is flat and, and people believe in the Mandela effect and people believe in you, you know, all kinds of stupid ideas. And what happens is the reason that they do this is because they neglect what the Word of God says. See, if we just stay within the confines of the Word of God and we allow it to define itself, we won't be out there uh, trying to explore something that's outside of God's power. And the other thing is we won't try to belittle or diminish the power that God has, not only in His Word, but in the things that it's going to do. It says it won't return to Him void. So I just want to leave you with a couple of points to look at as to what the power of God does in our lives and how we can apply it to the things that we're doing, specifically soul winning. And again, I'd, I'd like to thank you for your patience. I'm really trying to fight this hiccup. I thought it'd be gone. It started like 20 minutes ago, and apparently it just it won't go away. It seems to be getting worse, but we're, we're going to power right through it. But the first thing that we want to look at is I was looking at that verse, and there's there's a void, right? It's not going to return to him empty. It's not going to return to him fruitless. It's not going to return to him without giving something back. You know, when God's word goes out, it's going to return what he set out forth to, for it to do. Well, there's a couple of things that God's word sets out forth to do. Before we look at that, though, though it's interesting, the world, one of the main things that the world tries to do 
and man tries to teach and Satan tries to endorse is that we can look within ourselves to solve any of the world's problems. We can look to ourselves to solve any challenges that we have, right? And the challenge is that we need to stop trying to fill man's void and we just need to look at what God wants to be void. There are a couple of things that God creates voidness in. When he says it's not going to return to be void, he's already filling what he needs to, but there will be voids in his work. The very first thing, though, before we look at that is, look, when God does something, when he speaks the world into creation, he starts to fill in the the when he creates the world he starts to not only do the physical and natural world but you start to see some of the things that it ties to the spiritual world if you go to genesis 1 verse 1 i mean it's right there in the very beginning of god's word in the very beginning of god's word in genesis 1 verse 1 and we all know this right i mean if you've grown up in church long enough i mean that's probably the first verse you memorize in uh, as a as a young child it says in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth and by the way we use the King James because it's very specific the Bible does speak of heavens but when you're talking about Genesis 1 we're speaking specifically of heaven not heavens and there are versions of the Bible that speak and they say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and God didn't do that you know the heavens existed he created the heaven and the earth that we know in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and dark darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of god moved upon the face of the waters and god said that let there be light and there was light and god saw the light that it was good and god divided the light from the darkness so one of the very first things we can take from here is he does have some void he created the darkness right it's void of light he says i'm gonna i'm gonna speak the world into existence and i'm gonna create the world and i'm gonna create light and I'm going to create darkness. Well, spiritually, he divides, he divides us, right? If we're saved by grace, we're going to let our light shine unto the world. And he wants us to be separate from those that work in darkness, from those that work in iniquity. So we have to be very careful. Right away from the beginning, he says, look, there is a separation. And you need to be separate so that when my word goes out, through you, it won't return void. See, because if we're working in darkness, how can we produce light? In darkness without Christ we can't and that's the challenge is man's always trying to fill God's void he's they're always trying to create a need that's not there you know in sales we have a very popular saying that says if uh, if you want to be good at sales or if you want to create a business find a need or create a need and then fill it and I mean really if you think about it saying so good at doing that the government has basically made people you know dependent on the government by creating false needs right people think that they need the government to solve all their problems from food and shelter to even the moral uh, uh, compass that we live in today right the Bible says God created Adam and Eve God created man and woman but the world says look we we're gonna create a need and then we're gonna fill it we're gonna create this need of confusion of genders of more than one gender that we don't know what you are and you can become whatever you think you need to be and even if you don't know what you need to be well we'll just make it this very generic uh, non-definable term and then we're gonna fill that need by giving you all the tools necessary and all the medications and all the psychological help to become the wicked person that you want to be they want to live in that darkness but for us that live in light we have to then focus on the things that God wants us to focus so that we don't fall into that wickedness go to if you look there uh, in Genesis 5, it says, And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the, and the morning were the first day. So right away, God's speaking something, and he's creating the things that it returns to him, not void. Um, so the very first thing that we want to do is we don't want to fill man's void, but we want to fill God's void. Well, what are the things that God wants us to fill? What are the things that God wants us to do in our life so that we have that power behind us? If you, go, if you go to John 6, John 6, and I'll just read to you uh, Proverbs 14. You know, Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And that's what happens with the world, right? When we're trying to fill a void from our perspective, what we're doing is we're creating a way that seems right unto us. But the Bible says that when we do that, the end thereof are the ways of death. In other words, it not only leads to death, the physical death that we know, but it leads to the second death, which is the death that we're more concerned about, right? The first death 
Look, if you're saved in Christ, if you have eternal security, if you have that perpetual rest in Jesus Christ, I mean, at some point it's going to happen, so why even worry about it? You know, if, if I were to just up and croak right now here up on the pulpit, I mean, don't, there's nothing to mourn. I'm going to heaven. And I mean, people would probably listen to this and be like, what? what is this guy talking about? But the reality is that there is nothing to fear. But what we do need to fear is that eternal death. And I believe Proverbs 14, 12 is talking about that eternal death. See, the self-help is a snare of the devil. And, you, you, and if you guys don't think that, that exists out there in a strong level, I mean, just go into any school, go into any college, go into any job environment, and you're going to find that the very first thing they're going to teach you is a very type of self-help motivation. You know, you can do anything if you put your mind to it. You can create your life. You can schedule your life. You can control the items in your life if you just put your mind to it. But the reality is God says, look, I want you to focus on me because if not, there are ways, there are the ways of death. Then go to John 6, uh, 38. We're going to look there at John 6, 38. You know, God has given us his word to do his will. The only need that we need to fill, the only void that we need to fill so that it goes back to him is God's word, uh, God's will. You know, and what is the will of the Father? What is the will of God? In John 6, verse 38, it says, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, and this is Jesus speaking, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So honestly, it comes down to, you know, if we're looking at Isaiah 55 and it says, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. That's his will, right? And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Well, how do you prosper? Well, we follow Jesus' example. See, Jesus laid it all on the line. He died for our sins. He paid for our sins. And then he left us the example that we should do the same. Not lay our life for our sins, but preach his death, burial, and resurrection. Right? It says right there in verse 40, it says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son seeth the Son, and believeth on Him, may have everlasting life. And I will raise Him up the la at the last day. So how do we have everlasting life? Through Jesus Christ, of course. But the other thing that we see is, that's the void we need to fill. See, I get up every morning being a, in a, a bivocational preacher, and I have to go out there and be disciplined about the work that I do so that I can get back to the focus. This is the only focus this is the only work that won't return void. See, sometimes in life I get discouraged. You know, I'll go out there and we put a plan together for some business or, or I put a goal for one of my clients or whatnot. And the, the challenge is that nothing's guaranteed. And sometimes we're going to fail Simple over way. ourselves or some of the things that we put in place don't work. And it can be very discouraging when you don't see those goals come to fruition. And sometimes you think, well, if I do this, is this going to reap this reward? If I do that, is this going to produce this result? You don't know. But what you do know with God's Word is that when you're out there preaching the Word of God, whether I'm doing it from a pulpit or you're doing it at work or with your friends or family or we're door knocking, one of the things that we know for sure is that it's going to do what God has it already established to do. And that's the big thing is that it's always encouraging because no matter what we do, we're always producing a result. Because God's word is not going to come back to him fruitless. God doesn't do things in vain. You know, he doesn't just speak out of the two sides out of his mouth. Or he doesn't just speak to speak. You know, you ever meet those people? I'm guilty of that. Where sometimes, you know, the older I've gotten, the better I've gotten. But if you've ever been in a situation where you're in a group of people or you're conversing with others. And there's this awkward silence. You have this need to fill that void, right? That silence. And so then you just start jabbering at the mouth. I mean, you just start speaking of whatever and you basically you're talking about the weather or whatever you think comes to mind. And the reality is sometimes you need to leave that silence alone. But that's not the lesson here. The lesson is we tend to have void in our life when we're not focused on God. We will we'll say stuff. You know, I mean, I don't mind talking about the weather, but how fruitful can be talking about the weather 20 times a day just to fill in silence? It's not going to be fruitful. But see, instead of filling in that silence with the weather, 
How do we, why don't we fill it in with the Word of God, and then we can be fruitful about things. You know, I, I remember, you know, I don't, I don't hear it as often, or I tend to walk away from it, but I remember when I was younger, and I wasn't saved, you, you know, you're at work or, or with uh, other co-workers and stuff, and what do you end up talking about? The, the game last night, or the TV show. And I remember people getting real uh, into things. Like, I remember hearing conversations about, um, like, Star Wars. You know, that's one of those big things that people, when those new films come out, people get all up in arms. And they take the side of the filmmaker, or they take the side of the books. And then people start talking at length about, you know, should Star Wars have done this? And so this, this person had this? And should this new world have been created? I mean, think about how voidless, how fruitless of a, of a conversation that would be. And we're going to have to answer for our words. You know, every word we've spoken, we're going to have to, we're going to know whether it was fruitful or not. And I'm not, we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But as we grow in the Word of God, that's all that should be our focus. We should be on this. We should, I remember a long time ago, when I first started in financial services, I started with a company called uh, Primerica Financial Services. I was with them very shortly. But one of the things that the, the, the owner or the CEO of that company said is, look, you've got to eat breathe and sleep this stuff. You've got to eat, breathe, and sleep financial services. You've got to eat, breathe, and sleep insurance. You've got to eat, breathe, and sleep recruitment. You've got to eat, breathe, and sleep your goals. Well, that's real void. At the end of the day, even, let's say I would have been a millionaire or a billionaire. One day I'm going to die. I don't get to take anything with me. But the one thing I did like about that is that we've got to eat, breathe, and sleep God's Word. And we've got to eat, breathe, and sleep the gospel. And we've got to eat, breathe, and sleep the slow winning so that we can get the job done. And God says, look, if you go out there and you speak my word, it won't return void. That should be an encouraging thing that it's going to do the work that it was meant to do. Now, here's a couple of things that we need to look at. Because last week I spoke about sowing and reaping, you know, and the harvest. And if we just don't give up and if we do well... In, uh, in our well-doing, then we'll be able to reap if we faint not, right? And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. That's what we were talking about in Galatians 6. But there's, there comes a time where no matter how much sowing and reaping we do, whether it's in the literal sense, if you go out there and you plant a garden today, and you plant tomatoes and potatoes and corn and carrots and all that stuff, you've done the work that you need to do, but guess what? The rest is left up to the environment, right? You've got to have the right amount of rain. I hope there's no drought. If there's too much rain, it can drown the, the crops. If there's not enough sun, there's not going to be enough vitamins for it to grow and all that stuff. What's the same when it comes to the Word of God? See, we just our work is to get the Word of God out there. Our work is to preach the gospel, but God will do the rest. And let's go, go over to Matthew 7. Matthew 7. We're actually going to look at quite a bit there in Matthew 7 about God doing the rest of the work and talking about the fruit and what he wants when he says that it's not going to return void to him. And so we've got to focus and go to Matthew 7 and we're going to look at verse 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. Uh, Matthew 7, I guess uh, God really blessed. Uh, it sounds like my hiccups have disappeared. Hopefully they don't come back here uh, anytime soon. Go to Matthew 7, verse 15. And we're going to go all the way to verse 27. And let's just start there in verse 15. It says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth uh, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. In other words, into darkness, into eternal, utter darkness. See, when God separated the day from the night in Genesis, He also separated the spiritual day from the spiritual darkness. It says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? 
And I want to stop there and just focus on that a little bit right there is, see, the challenge is that's how the world wants you to do. They want you to find a need and fill it. They want you to create a work and then it becomes a work salvation. That's why I love that verse because right there it shows that salvation is by, work, uh, by grace, not by works, excuse me. Because right there he's saying, look, verse 22, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. See, the challenge is when they get to heaven, they're not saying, Lord, we, we're coming in because we believed on Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. No, Lord, look at my works. What does the Bible say? For, uh, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See, you can't get to heaven and say, look at my works, because no matter how many works we have in our life, we're going to fall short of the glory of God. And let's keep reading there in verse 23. It says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. See, it's so crucial to preach the right gospel. It's so crucial to have God's word go out and not our word. See, if we go and we put our thoughts and our opinions into God's word, it will return void, but not to God, to those that we've led astray. And, it, and he says, God, what God on that day will turn and say, I never knew you. Not... I know what you were doing, and it was bad works, and that's why I'm not letting you in. He's not even going to give an explanation because he never knew them. He says, Therefore, whosoever hearkeneth to these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. So see, first is, heareth the words, these sayings of mine, and then you do them. See, when you believe on God's grace, when you believe on His Word, that this is the infallible, inerrant Word of God, then you're only doing the work of God. The challenge is most of the time, we use the Bible as the pretext to do the things that we want to do. And then we're going to take Scripture and stories and lessons out of context so that we get the end result. And usually it's for filthy lucre's sake. Most of these religions, most of these false uh, 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 teachings end up being for some kind of prideful uh, recognition. Even uh, you look at uh, um, you look at religions like Jehovah's Witnesses, and and people say, "Oh, well, look, they're so humble, and they dress right, and they speak right, and do right." But really, it's a prideful work. What they're doing is they want to be noticed. You know, I don't know uh, if people notice what I do or not. I don't know if people listen to what I say or not. All I'm concerned about is doing the work of the Lord. If people take notice, it's because of the Lord, because His word goes out in unreturned void. And let's just keep reading there. In uh, verse 24, it says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And we know Jesus is that rock. He's our rock. And when we put our trust in Christ, then he gives us that wisdom to do the will of the Father. Let's keep reading there in verse 25 all the way uh, through uh, 27. And it says, And the rain descended, and the floods came down, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened to a full... And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so see, there is a consequence for thinking that you can do the work without God, that you can get things done without God. See, the reason that I read that little bit to you about the chaos theory and about the uh, butterfly effect is because that stuff's been around for a long time, but it hasn't been around since the beginning of time. See, man has tried to justify, and if you go in and you do all that study, they apply it to the psychological, they apply it to the world, they apply it to the way the politics work, and they're saying that there is a way that you can uh, get a good result by understanding this effect. The challenge is that they're trying to put their spin on it. It's their doctrine, it's not God's doctrine. See, we don't need science to tell us that what God said is going to go out comes back to us. And think about how wonderful that is, that this supernatural effect happens when God's word goes out. It's going to do much more than we ever imagined. You know, the Bible tells us that there's, 
there's good for us that, that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that there's things that, we're not, that we don't even know. We haven't seen or we haven't heard the things that the Lord has set out for us. The reason we don't understand that is because he says in the verses before that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than ours. And the challenge is that most of the time we're out there and we get busy doing the work of the Lord and then we get caught up in our own thoughts and we get caught up in our own ways and then we get discouraged and that's what causes us to stop showing up to church or stop going soul winning or stop reading our Bible or stop praying. We stop these things because we stop trusting the word of God. Uh, let's go down to ver uh, Matthew, I mean, go to Romans 7. Go to Romans 7. I'm just going to give you another uh, set of verses about how God does the rest of the work. Go to Romans 7. We're going to be there in verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Romans 7. Go to Romans 7, and we're going to go there to verse 1. We're going to go down to verse 6. Romans 7 says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, he is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, he, so then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the, that law. So that she is no she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit, uh, fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the old, oldness of the letter. And so what we see here is the Bible is telling us, look, we're no longer bound by the law. Now, our carnal, our flesh is bound by the law, but when we're in newness of spirit, we can do the work of the Lord. We can do that supernatural work. And I'm not talking like these Pentecostal, charismatic, Hispanic preachers, that, you know, I'm not going to get anybody up here and touch them and heal them. I'm not going to speak in some unknown tongue. But we have a supernatural power to the work that we do. The challenge is that most of the time when we get to do the work of the Lord, most people want to do the work of the Lord for the recognition. And so they only want to be involved in the big events. And they only want to be involved in the big churches. And they only want to be involved with the recognized preachers. And they only want to be involved with those brothers and sisters in Christ that seem cool. See, we have a cliquish mentality even when we're doing the work of the Lord. But the reality is that the work of the Lord that's most profitable is the one that just is the work of the Lord. And what do I mean by that? Is sometimes nobody notices but you and the Lord. Sometimes when you're praying in, in secret, that's when He's doing the work in public. And nobody will ever find out about your prayers until you get to heaven. The challenge is that we end up going to church and we want... You know, we take notice of that guy that prays really pretty and that sounds really good. And we're like, man, that guy's really doing the work of the Lord. And slowly but surely, we start moving away from doing the work of the Lord and it starts to become fruitless. And then we end up looking like Catholics or we end up looking like Mormons or we end up looking like Seventh-day Adventists where we just get up there and in the stroke of a pen say, look, hell, does, hell doesn't exist. You know, I'm just making reference to the Pope a couple of months ago, you know, because everybody thinks he's so pious and so great they consider him deity he just got up there and said look god's word says there's a hell but i don't think there's a hell that's voidless and fruitless god says look not only is there a hell but it's an everlasting darkness in the beginning he separated light from darkness and then we know that there's an eternal darkness so let's keep looking on here if you guys will go to isaiah 5 we're going to be in isaiah quite a bit so just just keep your finger there and the next point I want to give you is there is a good and evil that goes out from God's word. See, the challenge is most of the time when I've heard these set of verses, and, I, and it's a challenge only when we're not preaching the entire word of God. This is a very encouraging set of verses. And most of the time when you hear these verses, it's in that context. All positive, all happy, all nothing can hurt us. Nothing's wrong. The world's great. Everything's great. 
Jesus is great, nothing's wrong. But the challenge is we, that causes you to live in a bubble. And we kind of put on blinders in church, and we don't want to look at the evil that's going around in the world and of the sin that is permeating every day, the, you know, our friends and our neighbors and our family. And we just want to pretend like none of that's going on. See, it's funny. The Pope got up there and preached an entire message last week about how Satan, the adversary, is trying to destroy the Catholic Church by attacking these pedophiles, these reprobates that are abusing children, and nobody bat an eye. But Colin Kaepernick decides that he's going to knee instead of stand for the national anthem, and Christianity is all up in arms. You know, and I mean, I'm not downplaying the service that, uh, you know, those that serve in the military do. But come on, man. I mean, honestly, the work that God did on the cross is, cross is much more worthy. It carries much more worth than anybody dying on the battlefield for a country. I mean, those people that have died in, in, for this country so that we can stand up here and have these freedoms, I'm very grateful. But at the end of the day, if I don't have Christ, it doesn't matter how many soldiers die for us and how many people stood at the national anthem or bowed a knee or whatever they did. If you have no Christ, it's an eternity in hell forever. It doesn't make any sense for us to throw, spend all that time, all that sweat, all that tears, just because you know we didn't want to actually address the hard stuff. Because when we listen to this, and it says, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, and shall I return unto me void, all we want to look at is the word of God, this purdy and it feels good and it feels nice but we don't want to address the hard issues that are in the bible we don't want to talk about the hard stuff that the bible talks about go to isaiah 5 verse 20 and it says woe unto them they call evil good and good evil see we don't want to talk about the fact that the world is now calling evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness see darkness is void of light right that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be as rottenness, and their blue blossoms shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word, I mean, the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, not their people, his people. See, those that, that uh, woe unto them that are mighty and drink, and men of strong of strength to mingle drink, which justify the wicked for reward. He's talking to his people. It's the people, it's us who continue to live like the world lives so that we make God's word void by our actions because we're, we're uh, trusting on our works instead of his grace. There in verse 25, let's go back there, uh, Isaiah 5, 25, sorry. It says, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people and he hath stretched forth his hand against them and hath smitten them and the hills did tremble and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the street for all this anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. Still, see, when God's word goes out, it's also going to go out to do some damage. It's going to go out there to destroy the wicked. And we know that the world is lost. The Bible says in John 3, uh, 3, 18, that we're condemned already if we don't have Christ. Right? Jesus didn't come, come to condemn. There was no need for Jesus to condemn us because we were condemned already. The challenge is that the world is going out there saying, look, you can get saved. If you believe in Jesus, well, that's great. But you also got to stop sinning altogether or repent of your sins, as they say, right? And you've got to, uh, you know, follow the commandments. And you've got to feed the poor. And, you've got, and the Bible doesn't say any of that. And so what we do is instead of it returning not void to Christ or God Almighty, we're creating uh, His word void. What we're doing is we're creating a false testimony. We're creating a false doctrine. Go to... Go to Isaiah 45, verse 5. So just a couple of pages over to your right. Isaiah uh, 45. Isaiah 45. 
We're going to look at verse 5. <clears throat> Isaiah 45, and then we'll be in Genesis again. Go to Isaiah 5, 45. Uh, we're there in verse 5. We're going to go down to verse 13. 45, 5 through 13. You know, there is a good and evil that goes out from God's word. 45, verse 5 says, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, thou, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Drop down, ye heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe unto you, unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the pot, let the pot shirt strive with the pot shirt. Uh, let the pot strive with the pot shirts of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioneth it, What makest thou or thy work? He hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begettest thou? Or to the woman, What hast thou brought forth? Thus saith the Lord, O holy one of Israel and his maker, Ask me of the things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host. Have I commanded? <clears throat> have I commanded? Yeah, I'm sorry. I have raised him up in righteousness and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and he shall let go of my captives. Not for the prize nor reward, saith the Lord of hosts. So what we see here is that God is telling everybody that, or telling us that he's made everything. That he's made good and evil. And see, sometimes we go around trying to decide what is good and what is darkness without God's word. And so the challenge is that we'll go around and we'll point a finger at a brother or sister in Christ who hasn't shown up to church for a while. But we'll let all kinds of wickedness permeate the church. Because... You know, we want to have sympathy for the lost, or we want to love the sinner but hate the sin. Which, by the way, that's not even in the Bible. Gandhi came up with that statement, and Gandhi's probably, or no, not probably, he's been burning in hell for quite some time, at least 50, 60 years. The challenge is that we go around pretending like we're God. And sometimes what happens is when we're pretending to be God, we end up being nicer than God. God says, look, I separated light and darkness. You are light. And there is darkness in the world. You, you don't want to have anything to do with that. But we say, no, you know, we need to be a light to everybody. And we can light everything up. And so let's bring all that darkness in here. And let's see if we can light it up. And God says, there's no such thing. Because there's night and there's day. And there's everlasting darkness. We go around thinking that we can invite the pedophiles into our church. We can invite the sodomites into our church. We can invite the fornicators and the adulterers and the drunkards and the thieves and the liars and then we can change them all and then we're going to be better without God because we can save them God won't save them but we will you know we think that we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us except that we don't look at what God's strengthening us to do he says to go preach the gospel unto everybody and be ye separate from the world but we go around thinking hey we're going to preach the gospel to everybody and then we're going to bring them all in and that's a big deal. It's a big challenge because what we do is we diminish the power of God's word. Then what we do is, you know, we believe in the King James. This is the in, in, uh, inerrant, infallible word of God. But other people go, well, I don't know. It's very difficult to read the King James, even though it's written at an eighth grade level. So let's just create the NIV and the new King James and the NASV and the ESV and whatever other acronyms you can think of. And, and let's pervert the word of God because we just don't trust on that Isaiah 55, 11. We don't believe that his word can go out and not return to him void. Right? So let's go. Uh, let's just look at a couple of things and then we'll close out. Go to Genesis 6. And then we're going to be in Genesis 19. Go to Genesis 6. So the Bible tells us when God's word went out, and it's not going to return to void, He's preparing us and He wants us to learn certain things. So He's given us a historical background for things that have happened 
so that we know what's going to happen in the future. And in Genesis 6, 5, he's given us an account of the past, and he says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the, fowl of, and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I'll just read for you Matthew 28, 19. It says, Go ye therefore... I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I got ahead of myself. But if you guys have read in the... I, I, I touched on it last week. I I'm, was making reference to last week. The Bible says, As it was in the days of Noah, and it was in the days of Lot, so it shall be you know, in the end days. Well, look. I know a lot of people think we are in the end times. And I've heard people say, you know, if... You know, I just hope God takes me now and that we get raptured tomorrow. But the challenge is that we're not going to get raptured until certain things come. Well, the one thing I want you to focus on right there in uh, Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I know that there's a lot of wickedness and evil in this earth right now but I don't see it being continual just yet not in everybody not in the majority right there's still nations that have a better moral compass than other nations but this is talking about the entire world is gonna be like this you know we haven't even gotten started in my opinion in the things that are to come you know we think this transgenderism and this move to accept pedophiles is only the end of what we think is the worst but I think there's worse things to come than what could, we could even imagine. It says, the imagination, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And go to Genesis 19, verse 11. And uh, you can, if you turn there to Genesis 19, verse 11, it says, And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that it, they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Has thou here any besides? Son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters and whosoever thou hast in thy city, bring them out to this place. For we will destroy this place because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord hath sent us to, us to, hath sent us to destroy it. And what he's talking about is obviously we know the story of Lot. They go into the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And these Sodomites, these queers, are trying to rape the angels. And the Bible tells us in the future, this is how it's going to be. See, if you're thinking evil continually, even if you're blinded, you don't care that you were blinded. You want to finish the job that you started out to do, the evil that you continually are thinking in your mind. Think about that. You know, if, if, if God, God forbid, but if I got struck with blindness right now, the big thing I'd be trying to do is figure out how to live in a world where I was blind, not do whatever evil thought I was thinking of doing. But these guys, and I mean, by the way, I'm not thinking of doing anything. I'm just making that as an example that they were so focused on the evil they wanted to do, it didn't even matter that they were blinded. And God said, God says in, in the New Testament that that's how it's going to be before Christ returns. Before uh, we get ready to make our, our entrance into glory, that's how it's going to be. And then God tells us, look, that's the past. That's my word going out. It's not going to return to me void. I'm preparing you by showing you these examples. Let me tell you what you need to do in the present. Go to Matthew 28, or actually go to 2 Corinthians 6, and I'll just read Matthew 28. The Bible tells us in Matthew 28, 19. In the meantime, go to 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and, the Holy, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he gave us the Great Commission. If you go to 2 Corinthians 6, 1, what do we do in the present? It says, We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. See, don't just get saved and then be fruitless or void. You know, another word that we could put in there is the, God, the grace of God in voidness, 
and emptiness and fruitless. It says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. See, the reason we do the work that we do for the Lord is because we are encouraged that when, we, when his word goes out, it won't return void because he says today is the day of salvation. See, what are we supposed to do with God's word in the present? How are we supposed to make it non-void? We do the work of the Lord, which is today is the day of salvation. So look, if you're saved, that's great. But don't hoard it. Go out there and let the world know that there's a gift that's eternal and that it's going to help them avoid eternal damnation. I mean, really, it comes down to that. The power of God's word is that it can change people for all eternity. I mean, if God sent his son to die on the cross, is Jesus not enough for us to get saved? Do we have to go out there and try to reinvent the wheel? There's no wheel to reinvent. I mean, God sent his son and he died once so that we could go out there and preach the word once we've received his grace. And in the future, go to Matthew 24, and then I'll, and I'll close out. Go to Matthew 24. And uh, this is where I, where I was going with all that. But, uh, you know, I got ahead of myself. Go to Matthew 24, verse 21. Matthew 24, verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen, as such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, nor ever shall be. So see, we haven't gotten to that point yet. See, they were thinking wickedness continually. continuously. They were blinded and didn't give up. That was that past. I showed you those examples. But it says here, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. See, there are times where we shouldn't believe things. We believe on the Lord, but we shouldn't believe just everybody and every wind of doctrine and every new idea that they come up with because they twisted scripture. It says, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forward. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sight of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send the angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. To the other. And so we see God, there is power in God's word. Not just power in the word like the Bible. I mean, this is God's word, but what I'm talking about is just God's word, period. See, we know what he's spoken to us in this word. But there's things that we just... We haven't heard. We don't know. I mean, the Bible even tells us that he's going to get a name that we've never heard, that we don't know of when he returns, right? There's power in that, so stop diminishing the power of God's word. And I'm not saying that you're doing it, but we have sometimes, we're human, right? And when the flesh takes over, we have a tendency to diminish God's power. And it, sometimes it doesn't even have to be by preaching the wrong gospel. It doesn't even have to be by preaching the wrong message. Just getting caught up in the wrong argument or in the wrong fight can diminish God's word. See, if we're out there preaching God's word and then we get caught up. So, for example, you know, I used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. You guys know that and I'm gonna, I'll probably say this for the rest of my life. But if we get caught up in trying to prove that the Sabbath is not the Sabbath that you're talking about, it's the day of rest and it's not Saturday instead of Sunday and it's not the worship of Saturn, you're missing the point. 
The point is not to argue whether the Sabbath is the Sabbath that they're talking about or whether you should eat pork versus cow meat or whether you should eat cow meat versus pork. The, the, the reality is that you should talk about the death, burial, and resur resurrection of Jesus Christ and that that's the only way into heaven. And that that's the only work worth doing. And that that's the only thing that we should do. Go back to Isaiah 55 and we'll close out with this. Why preach this message at all? You know, why preach the power of God's word? Why explain that there's a present, past, and a future? Why explain that there's good and there's evil in the word? Why explain that God's work has to be done? Because it should be an encouragement to us that regardless of what we perceive as the result, it doesn't matter if we're doing the work of the Lord. Isaiah 55, verse 12, we'll close out with this. Says, For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you in singing, and the trees of the fields shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. See, we will have an everlasting sign if we just do the work of the Lord. We're going to go out there with joy and with peace. See, the challenge is that I think really people get discouraged in the work of the Lord because they're focused on their work. See, if I were to focus on just the work, you know, then I'd get discouraged. It's very easy to discourage yourself. You know, I'll give you a great example. And I'm not, I mean, I, I'm not going to discourage myself because I'm preaching it, but it's very easy, right? I didn't get saved till I was 25. I know preachers that have been preaching since they were 17. When I was 17, believe me, the last thing on my mind was one, being saved, and number two, doing this work. So then I'm 38 now, and I'll start to look, and if you really, you know, this is how the world thinks, right? They're like, well, I wasted all that time, and I didn't get anything done. You know, what am I good for? Now, I'm, now I don't have that, that many years to preach, that many years to do the work of the Lord. I'll never catch up to that guy, or I'll never preach as many sermons as so-and-so, or I'll never knock on as many doors. You know what? It's not even worth it. I'm just going to show up to church and I'm going to give my tithes. And you know what? My tithes, they'll go out there and do the work of the Lord. And my prayers, I know God's doing the work. But he says, look, you need to go out there and, and do the work. He says, for you shall go out with joy and be let forth with peace. See, it's not enough to sit in your closet and pray. And it's not enough to just show up to church and tithe. And it's not enough to just show up at church Monday, I mean, uh, Sunday uh, morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday uh, evenings. It's to go out there and do the work of the Lord. When you go out, what are you doing? You have to go out of your house and go knock some doors. Or you go out there in the work environment, you talk to people, and you remind yourself that it's not what you perceive as the result. Because believe me, we have, there's more rejection doing the work of the Lord than there is acceptance. If we were to count all the doors that we've knocked in the last year, the percentages of people gotten saved to the percentages of people that we've knocked on doors is minuscule. And if you look at it from a world perspective, from a business perspective, from a statistical perspective, man, that's not even work worth doing. The challenge is we need to stop diminishing God's power because he says there, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Well, prospering, you know, in business, people want you to be prosperous, and the way they rate it is, you know, how much money you're making or what promotion you're getting or, you know, what kind of French benefits you have. But in God's work, it's just doing the work. We don't know what God's doing behind the scenes when we go out there and do His work. And so I guess at the end of the, the, the day, even though the message has good and bad in it, the, 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 the gist of this message is don't get discouraged and get back to doing the first works, the first love, which is soul winning. You know, we, we do soul winning every week here on Sunday afternoon. That's for sure. And if we don't, if for some reason we have to change it around, we're going to do soul winning sometime during the week. And we, want, and we do soul winning some Saturdays. And we do soul winning some Wednesdays. And you know what? If somebody wants to sow in on an odd day, let's go sow winning on an odd day. And if we're not sowing it together, if you're at work and you sow in, do it. Because you know what? It's not discouraging if somebody says, well, I don't know if you should talk about Christ at the work environment. Who cares? Honestly, who cares if they get mad? 
Because you're doing the work of the Lord and you don't know what that seed planted is going to do in the future. And I have gotten phone calls from God's word. Here's how crazy it is. And I'll close out with this. Uh, and I literally will close out with this. Many years ago when I was searching God's word, I was still a Seventh-day Adventist and I started arguing with the Seventh-day Adventist preachers. And I remember one time I got in an argument. This actually happened several times. I can't remember the specific time. But I'm really loud and vociferous. And other people were listening and I didn't care. Well, fast forward. 2005, I got saved. 2011, I got married. And about 2012, I get a phone call from some former Seventh-day Adventist friends of mine asking me if I was still a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, no, you know, I'm no longer Seventh-day Adventist. I've got, I got saved by grace. I don't believe in works anymore. You know, all that stuff is just false. It's a cult. It's from the pit of hell. It's satanic. And they said, oh, good. I'm glad you said that because we've been studying our word and we remembered your arguments, you know, 10, 15 years ago, how you didn't always agree with everything that the Seventh-day Adventist Church preached. And it made us question if we were even following the right thing. And I got to go through the gospel presentation and lead that couple to the Lord. And it wasn't even when I was saved because God's word doesn't return void unto him. We don't know the work that God's doing behind the scenes unless we do the work. See, because the only thing that you, that you know for sure is that if you're void in your work, well, then you're void in your fruit too. And you're not doing any work for the Lord. So bottom line, don't diminish the power of God's word. Don't diminish that butterfly effect that people talk. Don't diminish that in the chaos of what we're doing, there is a purpose. It's not random. There is a pattern, and God's pattern is stronger than anything that we could ever imagine. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach this message, Lord, and thank you for getting rid of the hiccups. But more importantly, Lord, help us to go out there and, and let your power shine through us. And let us be that light to the world and not darkness. And help us not only to not involve ourselves in darkness, and that when we do light others and when we give them the gospel presentation, they accept that grace, and now their light shines, that we go out there and we preach your word so that their light isn't dimmed or diminished by uh, involving itself in darkness. The only time that we should be dealing with darkness is when we're spreading the light. But we shouldn't be trying to be living in darkness or dealing in darkness or having fellowship in darkness or fellowship with the darkness of this world. So Lord, just help us to remind ourselves that no matter what the result is that day, whether it be zero souls saved or one or two or five, we know that there's more work being done behind the scenes with your supernatural power. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.